Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Soccer Queens podcast, where we discuss everything female athlete performance training. I have a treat for you today. I have an amazing guest who is going to dive into the latest research on ACL injuries and how to program and reduce chance of injury. Emily has been on the show before. She now goes by Emily Neff. So if you don't recognize her, I'm sure you'll be able to go back to her previous episode, but she is an amazing coach to youth female athletes. And she's also doing some heavy research around training them. So Emily, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Eric. I'm so happy to be here. I can't wait. Let's, um, before we get into today's topic on ACL injuries, why don't you just remind everyone who you are and what you're up to today? Perfect. So yes, as you said, my name is Emily. So I am the owner of a female athlete performance center called Relentless Athletics located in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. We are in our seventh year of business now. Um, and it is fantastic because We are an all-female staff that serves only female athletes. We work with athletes ranging from nine years old up through college, and really our biggest focus is strength and conditioning training, individualized program design, through a lot of sports injury rehab where we work side by side with physical therapists and kind of assist with that return to play, return to competition, as well as a little bit of speed and agility. So that's my working title. And on the side, I'm actually just starting my uh, PhD where I am studying ACL injuries and female athletes, looking at the frequency of injuries and females that resistance train at a minimum of one time a week year round. Also looking at those athletes that have regular menstrual cycles compared to those that do not. Um, so that is my current, current title and what I'm currently doing outside of Relentless. This is just such an awesome combination of experience and evidence-based practice. And I just, I love what you guys do at Relentless. I mean, again, I see your Instagram and I just see all these female athletes, they're lifting heavy and they're just looking to really improve. And it sounds like you have such a great thing going on there, but let's dive in to the research side of things. And then if you want to incorporate some of the stuff you're doing with your female athletes would love to hear, but for ACL injuries for many years, we've looked at the research, but there's definitely a lot of gender biases going on and just some misconceptions. So what have been some of your biggest findings around current practice with ACL injuries? Yeah. I mean, the biggest misunderstanding is that all of our previous research, there is a confounding variable that we have yet to look at, and that is the training age of the individual. So right now, when we look at previous research, we see, well, female athletes experience ACL injuries at a much higher rate compared to males. You know, um, there's the previous theories that it is because of our Q angle, which still in research, there is actually no way of measuring the Q angle. How do we do that? Let's, it's not a real thing. Um, It could be because of our femoral notch size because our notch sizes are are smaller compared to males or it could be because of our um, ACL has more estrogen receptors on the actual ligament compared to males. But with that, of course, my side of things to play devil's advocate is, well, for the estrogen receptors, of course we have more estrogen receptors. We have more estrogen circulating within our body. If you look at any cell, we express more estrogen receptors compared to males. Looking at the notch size as well, females reach peak height velocity at an earlier age compared compared to males, which is why we are smaller body size. So these are all, I think you actually put it best, um, we can't change those things. So whether they were true or not, we, there's nothing for us to do about it. But when we look at current research that now dives into, okay, what about the confounding variable of training age? Let's look at males versus females. But besides looking at sex difference, let's look at their experience within strength and conditioning. And if we use that as the deciding factor between, you know, what is the difference in ACL injuries? the difference goes away. 
And that instead we see the difference exposed to those athletes that are not engaged in any type of strength and conditioning training, especially year round. So what that indicates is that rather than it being a sex difference, there's a big difference between sex and gender. It seems as though this is more of a gender difference because society in our society, we don't push female athletes into the strength room to the same extent that we do males. So if females are not being exposed to this type of training year round, we're seeing that there's an increased instance of injuries. So that is really one of my passions for why I started Relentless, because even though we didn't have that specific research, it was still pretty evident growing up that, hey, when I was in the weight room, I'm the only girl and this feels weird. And I, you know, was kind of looked down upon of what is this girl doing in the weight room? This is a place that I don't belong. And I like to change that narrative here at Relentless, which is why we're all females, because I wanted to make, make an environment that is all females and that this is for you. This place is for you, but you're training, not because you're a girl, it's because you're an athlete. And as an athlete, we have to prepare our bodies for the stressors of our sport and all of these previous, you know, issues with, well, our notch sizes are different or our, our ACLs are more lax. Well, all of tissues, tissues respond to progressive overload. So those actually are things that we can impact through training. And that's a big gap in the research that very slowly we're starting to fill, which really is what drove me to want to go back to school and get my PhD, using my relentless girls as a big part of my test subject, because I feel as though there's, it's very hard to find females within strength and conditioning to be, especially this age group to test. And I'm very unique and I have a gym full of them. So I'm excited to be able to do research on them and actually, you know, have this research be published so that we can get more coaches and parents to understand previous practices are not enough for helping reduce this chance of an ACL injury. We have to do things differently. We have to start training our females as athletes versus as fragile beings. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I love that. And I love that you touched on how there's, there's so many things that we just can't control. Like it's good to know this stuff as coaches and practitioners, But at the end of the day, we can only help our female athletes with what we can actually do and the the stimulus we can provide them in the gym. And I love that you're doing the the research with your girls. And I think I saw somewhere, I, I forget what the numbers are, but there's just not a lot of studies with the adolescent female population Mm -hmm. and in order to keep improving our practice and our programming, we, we need that. Um, so do you just want to dive into some of the, the gender biases? Because this is still very new and not a lot of people are aware of this. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting that it is new. Um, that, I mean, we're what year 2022 and this is new that we're looking at females and we're like, wow, should we prepare you for sport to the same extent that we do males? Um, so these gender biases, you can, you can, you can watch the timeline from when females first started being introduced to sport and our sports were different. Our rules were different because we had this idea that females are not capable of doing the same, you know, high stress, high competition activities versus male, either we're incapable or it's unladylike and ever so slowly females have been more exposed to sports and sport rules have changed. And now basketball is the same sport and we don't have certain dribbling uh laws like they did in the past where girls can only dribble three times before they pass because you don't want to overexert yourself and these are all gender biases these are not sex biases it's not because physiologically the female is incapable it's because from a gender perspective we look at females from a societal view and say oh unladylike this is not what most girls do when you grow up in that society, you think, I don't want to get big and bulky. I don't want to look like a man um, versus understanding that is not something that happens on accident. Uh, <laughs> all of us are very different. I always, I always like to laugh and say, I'm sorry, but I have yet to, I've, I've seen many a little boys that I'm not worried about him going in the weight room and thinking he's going to bulk up. That kid is still not bulking up. Why do we think this is going to happen to your young 12 year old? It is not. And Unfortunately, because especially with youth sports, most of our coaches aren't coaches. This is not their full-time job. They're doing this on the side. This is something that they probably didn't go to school for. 
And a lot of coaches practice in the way that they were coached. And we're in this unfortunate cycle where we're not pushing females into the strength room because our coaches, when they were athletes, didn't go to the strength room until probably when they were in college. And this is something that we have to address at that level, just because this is not something you did. Times are changing. Also, we're playing sports as such a high volume compared to what we were doing before. You know, I think back when 20 years ago, we pushed this, you know, multi-sport athlete because back 20 years ago, when you were a multi-sport athlete, you stopped playing your other sport. You would play soccer one season, then you would play basketball another season while not playing soccer. And now it's turned into, well, you play soccer year round and then throw in three other sports so that we're a multi-sport athlete, but we're forgetting to look at the fact that we are still humans and we can't keep spiking our training without any preparation for those spikes. So the conversation of multi-sport versus, you know, specializing seems to be kind of mute because we're, we're forgetting to talk about what we actually know is a tool that can reduce the chance of overuse injuries by 50% and non-contact ACL injuries or overuse injuries. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's talk into, let's talk about the programming around ACL injuries. So, I mean, th it, there's just so much out there. And I think a lot of parents and female athletes, they're like, well, where do we start first? What do we need to do for this? And there's research on the, the brain and slow reaction time, and then glute need weakness. And then you've got your nutrition, your lack of sleep and all those go into a ACL risk. But mm -hmm. what are like your top three non-negotiables to reduce chance of ACL? Mm -hmm. Well, one, you have to be on an individualized program design that takes into account what your training mode looks at. The science of periodization is based on the individual. So just having an athlete join a random gym and doing things is great. It's great for a start. Unfortunately, that's not enough. We need to put our athletes, they need to be engaged in an actual strength and conditioning program that's based on them and what their life looks like outside of your, your four walls of your gym. So non-negotiable is compound strength training movements. We need to get our athletes strong doing functional movement patterns because besides developing strength, it develops muscle firing patterns. And that's something that unfortunately a lot of research has kind of taken to, you know, taken a big right hand turn and saying, oh, okay, we need to work on neuromuscular training. And that means we need to do like, let's teach our athletes specifically. This is how, you know, don't let your knees come in. Don't do this where when you look at the research of motor skill acquisition, because all movement is a motor skill, is that you can teach someone to do something all day. And the moment you put them in a state where they are fatigued or exerting high, they will revert back to the movements that they feel strongest in. So instead of teaching our athletes, you know, explicitly do this, don't do this, we need to instead build efficient movement patterns where your body feels strong and fires in that way. So that when they are on the field and they are feeling fatigued, their body moves with efficiency because you've innately built that movement pattern, but not by doing so by telling your athlete, don't let your knees come in. Instead, you have to put your athlete in efficient movement patterns through training, through progressive overload. So that's first non-negotiable. Second non-negotiable is your athlete is a field sport athlete. She needs to be sprinting. Obviously, you should not be sprinting year round because Right after your competition season, please do not go outside and go run sprints. This is when you should be doing low joint loading. Again, this needs to be prescribed by someone that understands load management. But leading up to your season, if you have, if you're trying to get faster and you're going to be running a lot, please stop steady state running. This is not the same, the same muscle fibers that we're trying to activate. We need to do some type of sprint, some type of cutting, preparing you for the season. And then when you're in your season and all you're doing is sprinting and cutting, you don't need to supplement additional training there. That's where we have to manage our training load. So if you're in your competition season, you really shouldn't be doing too much extra sprint training unless your competition season is later. And this is just a a fun season. And that's a different conversation. So that's two. 
And then number three is we have to have our athletes understand the principles of, of nutrition and recovery. Um, there is no other way besides preparing an athlete and, re- and having her recover that's going to help reduce her chance of experience an ACL injury. So having her understand what her macronutrients are. Research shows that female athletes on average spend a greater part of their day in a state of catabolism, mm-hmm. not intentionally. This is not an intentional, we're not talking about the, you know, girls that are suffering with some type of eating disorder. We're talking about girls that are really busy and they're only eating two to three times a day. Unfortunately, those big gaps between meals leads your body to be in a state of breakdown. And when you're in a greater state of breakdown versus building, we see a higher rate of injuries. So we need to have our athletes not only understand macronutrients, but more importantly, understand how to eat more frequently throughout the day to make sure that we're just meeting those energy requirements. We like to teach our girls to understand how your period can be an indicator if you're recovering or not. So is it frequent? Is it infrequent? Does it seem to go away when you're in season? That's not normal. That's something, that's a warning sign. That's a big red flag that we need to target. That means that we're doing a little too much, then your body is able to recover. That's an indicator that, hey, a big injury, you have a higher chance of getting a big injury down the road. So conclusion, three non-negotiables, compound strength training movement patterns year round with an emphasis on training load management, sprint training with an emphasis on training load management and nutrition education that helps improve our athletes eating frequency throughout the day. Oh my gosh. There's so many good things there. The, the first thing you, you mentioned is how programs need to be super individualized. And I think I tweeted about this the other week, but people just try to like get away with a quick Google search. Oh, you know, what balance exercises can my girls do or what hit banded walks can they do? And, you know, I applaud the effort, especially from coaches and parents who want to take that step to learn more about it. But the, the truth is there's just so many different needs within mm-hmm. female athletes and the training age you mentioned earlier in the conversation. Well, it's probably not smart to load a girl with thirties in each hand on a split squat. If she has never done this training before <laughs> and hasn't mastered the movement. So let's, let's talk about like the movement mastery, like what mm-hmm. types of things should people be working on unloaded first before mm-hmm. they begin to add the dumbbells or barbell? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I love that because that's a, that's a a hierarchy. We like to follow here at relentless. And that's something that research has shown over and over again. We need to develop first movement competency. So what are our main compound movements? Do we understand the difference between a squat, a hinge, a push, a pull? Do we know how to lunge? Do we know how to stabilize our core? do we know how to carry? These are some of our main movement patterns. So let's understand these movement patterns in terms of efficiency. So what are the three things we're looking for in a squat? We want a nice upright torso. We want our um, knees to be in line with our toes and we want our weight to be distributed in the middle of our foot. That's how we go about coaching. What are our three points? What are the three things we need to see once you instill that competency? Now we need to instill efficiency, meaning Can we do that now over time? Does she have one beautiful squat, but then tomorrow she comes in and we're like, we're back to square one. What, what, this is not the movement pattern that we've taught you. So it's not only, can you do the movement pattern, but can you repeat that over time from there? Then we talk about, let's build strength in those movement patterns. You do that through periodization. Let's build muscle mass. Let's build strength. Let's have that strength turn into power speed. But all of those come after the basics, the foundational movement patterns. Does your athlete know how to do this? From there, can we actually talk about, you know, different loading structures, different volume sets, tempos, reps, all that should come way after we focus on developing good movement patterns, because that in itself is a motor skill and that improves our muscle firing patterns. And that's going to allow your athletes to automatically build improved coordination and balance because her muscles are firing together. And that's what we really need to see while of course, incrementally improving our strength along the way, because our muscles not only need to adapt, but also our tendons and ligaments, and they need an external load. So a big thing I like to have our athletes understand is that you can't move wrong. You're a human being. You didn't get injured because you moved incorrectly. 
that's, there's no wrong movement pattern, but there are efficient movement patterns. So let's get away from being subjective of that's bad. That's good. Let's talk about efficiency. What does efficiency look like? How do we build efficiency in our athletes while long-term developing that muscular strength as well as tendon and ligament stiffness? And that takes years of habitual practice within the weight room. There is no fancy fix. There's something I always like to tell our parents here is that your daughter is involved in sports to teach her life lessons. You are in, you are, we are in a state where females, very few of them are going to do this professionally. And if you do, you're not going to make a lot of, it's hard to make a career out of it. So instead, let's look at sport as a means to teach our athletes lessons. They have to understand what it means to prioritize things that they want. They have to learn that they have to sacrifice. Yeah, you need to get to the gym three times a week. And that means you might have to miss a hangout with your friends but you're teaching them that they have to make sacrifices in order to achieve goals. That's how life works. We have responsibilities. You're teaching teamwork. You're teaching communication. That's our goal of sport. So we need to make sure that our, our athletes understand like going to the weight room is part of the responsibility of the athlete to be prepared for her sport and help reduce her chance of injury. It's a non-negotiable. And it's something that we need more parents and coaches to understand that this is a life lesson that if you want, you, you know, the payoff, you got to put in the work, you got to make some sacrifices and you have to be consistent at it over time. Sacrifice keyword there. And I need to ask you like when in season rolls around do you ever get the, oh, well, you know, school's getting busy, like schedule's getting crazy. Like we might need to put you as a strength coach on the back burner and take off for a couple months and kind of pop in and out. Do you experience that? And what's oh, your response? Yes. And, you know, our response has to be educational. So I always give them the, hey, strength training is the only thing that can reduce the chance of an overuse injury by 50%. We'd love to see your athlete for at least one hour a week. Here's ways that we can make this easier for you because a lot of times, you know, we get it. You're the chauffeur as the parent, you're taking your kid here. Here's ways, hey, we have, you don't even have, we have an unlimited in-season program. You can come in as many times as you want in-season yeah. for a very discounted cost. You can only do it one time a year, but these are our efforts to help you prioritize this. Hey, you're winning and your athlete is going to be stronger because of it. And sometimes it, sometimes we have our, our athletes that buy in other times we have athletes that don't. And oftentimes those are the athletes that sad, they do get injured and it's like, then they come back and inside I'm like, I told you so <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I wasn't making this up. Right. Um, it's great that we've been here so long because we have such great athletes that maybe have been here for almost all seven years. So we can show, Hey, look at this great softball player. She's committed to go play D1. Over the past five years, she has consistently maintained a two to three times a week training routine, mm -hmm. both in and out of season. She has never experienced an injury. This is not something, and of course, with anything, there's a chance of injury. You can't prevent anything, but you can reduce the risk. So is there, is there a chance? Yes, of course, you're playing sport. That's, that's the name of the game. But you can drastically reduce that risk. So it just comes down to us having that conversation and trying to provide education. I like to think that like our parents, when someone says no, it's because it's really a question. It's really of, well, this isn't that important, right? Like this is something that we do in the off season. That's what I did in the off season. So I like to say, you know, teach the girls that work here is that let's use that as a conversation opener of, hey, I understand why you think that. Let me give you the research for why it is imperative to try to prioritize at least one time a week for your athlete. Hey, we opened up all day Sunday for you. Do you think that there's a time you can get here at least once a week? Here are the things that your athlete can gain because of it. I, I've heard that the, the one time a week in season is enough to, to maintain, but uh, by all means, guys do not do that in the off season if you're trying to get better. Um, but the one to two times a week, non-negotiable in season to make sure that those muscles aren't 
withering away and you're also prioritizing recovery. And do you just Mm -hmm. want to talk about recovery real briefly and and what it means and why it's important in season? Mm -hmm. Yes. So in season, you're at a state of high stress. You, besides physically you're being you're stressed because you're playing much more but from a psychological position you're still being stressed and your body sees stress as the same it doesn't matter if it's physical if it's mental you have a big exam stress is stress and the female athlete's job during season especially is to mitigate those stressors so that's where when you are coming once a week that's you know much better than nothing because you have an external eye that can use the tools in the weight room to see how well you're recovering. What is your bar speed? What is the intensity in which she can work at now compared to where she was before? How does that demonstrate? Hey, you're definitely moving it much slower at the same intensity you were last week. This tells us that we're not really recovering that well. We're going to adjust your program to help make sure that when you leave here, you feel much better than you did coming in. You know, there's no way to recover better than focusing on your sleep and nutrition. Of course, we want to make sure our girls are staying mobile and they're just feeling good. They don't have weird, you know, tightness or discomfort in their, in different areas. So of course there's ways that we can help reduce that feeling. We can do foam rolling, which is just a a sense of self massage, um, some active stress, active stretches, some type of, you know, yoga type of movement patterns. All of those are fantastic. And we actually have a recovery class too that we do here in season just to help girls understand like, hey, here's, you don't know how to do certain things. Let us show you. But within that class, we actually, we have a curriculum because it's 12 weeks and each, each time a coach runs it, as they run that class, they have a discussion. Let's talk about what we should be eating after a game. And let's talk about our sleep habits during the season. So talking about those main blocks that are actually impacting our ability to recover. Those are things that we need to make sure always stay at the top of the conversation because without sleeping eight to 10 hours a night, without eating enough food to meet your energy demands, as well as making sure you're having enough of each macronutrient throughout the day, it doesn't matter how much you're stretching or foam rolling. It's not going to have as much of an impact as the other big guys. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the girls who continue with you in season are also the girls who are the least sore, uh, the least fatigued as well. I don't know if you found that, but a lot of the girls who continue year round, their muscles are so strong. The integrity of their joints is really great and they don't really get sore. Um, and they bounce back a lot quicker. Uh, Mm -hmm. so go figure guys, Mm -hmm. but this stuff is so powerful and it is a, it is a year round pursuit and we cannot reiterate this enough. And it also does teach that discipline. It teaches sacrifice because it's like, well, when you're done playing your sport and you get busy and you have a career or, you know, you're a mom, you still have to prioritize your health. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not going to end. So if anything, like Emily said, it is a a life lesson. It's a lesson on sacrifice and Mm -hmm. prioritizing what's good for you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Exactly. We need to instill these habits now. Because if you wait until you're in your 30s, your 20s and 30s, you're too far gone. You're too far gone into the habits that you have developed as a kid. Let's develop these habits now so that when your athlete does go to college and she has all of this time and she has no idea what to do and it's so overwhelming, she has a routine already developed because you've you've helped her instill the importance of prioritizing your her health, her sleep, her nutrition. Let's make sure that she knows the importance of doing this, whether she's in sport or not but develop those habits now. So they last a lifetime. So, so good. Now I want to take a a hard left turn in this conversation, but we've kind of touched on menstrual cycle a little bit and main difference between male and female athletes. We have to take the menstrual cycle into consideration. And what, what do we know about the menstrual cycle impact on ACL injury? Mm -hmm. Great question. Cause what we know is not too much. Unfortunately, there's, there's, I think it was about in the mid to late nineties, early two thousands, there's this big influx of research that show that, you know, females are experiencing ACL injuries during the first part of their menstrual cycle. But now if we look at our review articles that go back to those previous articles and we're like, well, hold up, 
the only way we knew that the girls were in their follicular stage is because we asked them. And I'm sorry, but what 13 year old is like, yes, this is the follicular stage of my menstrual cycle. So one, we're relying on self-recall, which is a very poor measurement, making it a very weak research. Second of that, we're forgetting that not only is your menstrual cycle between each individual always different, each menstrual cycle you have is different. The concentration of your hormones are not always going to flux up and down the exact same way at the exact same time each month. It's variable because your hormones are affected by so many things. Stress is a big one of them. So a big thing that we know is that we don't know much about the menstrual cycle, but what we do know is that when the menstrual cycle is missing, we're seeing a big increase in injuries. So that's something to focus on because it is very difficult to research the menstrual cycle because of these differences. I'd love to see a baseline study of just, you know, what is those difference? I'd love for us to take, I mean, it's very difficult to do so, but I'd love that if we could have research on a female that just got her period, let's measure her luteinizing hormone over the course of three years and the distance between those spikes to see how variable is each menstrual cycle, especially when you're first getting your period, how variable is each cycle and how is that going to allow us to then make such conclusive statements as you are very fragile during this you know, one phase. And something I always like to say is that if we just pull back from you know, the, the nuance of research details, Let's think this one through, guys. We have been humans for a very good amount of time, and being a human is fantastic because we can evolve and adapt. If we were so fragile during a certain phase of our menstrual cycle and we were so much more active decades ago, why wouldn't we have adapted out of that fragility? Um, further, just making you question are we actually that fragile? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. But of course, from an individual standpoint, see how you're feeling. Like, teach. It's important for girls to understand, to recognize what their symptoms are, what they feel when they're getting their period. Are they feeling really lethargic? What can they do when that happens? Instead of saying, oh, woe is me, I'm on my menstrual cycle. Um, that doesn't really teach anything and doesn't lead to much. And I think that we're gonna, in the next couple of decades, we're going to continue to have not a lot of research on ACL injuries and menstrual cycles. We have a lot of people that are getting involved into looking at, you know, eating differently for your menstrual cycle or training differently for your menstrual cycle. And all of it is, could be maybe effective for like that top tier athlete where all of the stuff is already in place. She's already training year round. Her nutrition is set and she's an endurance athlete and she really, she's in the Olympics and these are the small things mm -hmm. before the everyday woman. That is just, even, even if you're on a high level soccer team, it's going to have very little impact on you versus the big, the big stepping stones, the big thing. So unfortunately not too much research because it is difficult and it is difficult because oftentimes when we look at ACL injuries in females, we're not looking at is, is an athlete on an oral contraceptive? Is she not? Is she, is she having a regular menstrual cycle? Is she not? Those are all what we call confounding variables. So without isolating those variables, your research doesn't help us much. It always bothers me when I hear coaches saying, oh, well, they're more susceptible during this phase. And it's just frustrating because it's like, A, there's not enough research. How do you know? But B, say she is, say we know they're more susceptible to ACL during the follicular phase. And mm -hmm. we know that as a fact we're still going to be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. We're still going to be doing the same controllables, whether we know this information or not, we're going to mm -hmm. still do year round strength training, mm -hmm. talk about proper nutrition, maybe extra protein intake during certain mm -hmm. phases. It, it's like, it, it doesn't, I want to say it doesn't really matter because we're still going to control what we can control. So exactly. it's just frustrating. <laughs> like what, it, what do you expect your athlete is going to get? you know, get her period in her follicular stage is starting. And it's like, sorry, coach can't play today. Right. <laughs> like like life goes like, on. Not gonna happen. <laughs> and from a psychological standpoint, because we know the impact of our psychological being actually affects our movement patterns and how we deal with competition. We're doing more harm than good telling our athletes, you are mm -hmm. much more fragile. You're much more susceptible right now. 
Yes. You're now setting your athlete up for failure. Let's use positive words because that actually has been shown to benefit our athletes. Mm-hmm. And let's have our athletes understand, oh, I'm so sorry. Like you have your period that really stinks. How do you feel? Let's talk about how you feel because you probably don't have a lot of people to talk about that with. Like totally complain about your cramps to me. I can relate. And then let's get to work. Because right. we have things to do. Okay. So this is going to get interesting because I hear a lot of, well, we need to like, really like track the cycle and program around it and then like cut back here and then add here and take advantage of testosterone levels. And I'm just like, yeah, but like, do we ever get to a point where we are kind of babying our athletes? Like we still kind of have a program to complete and to progress. So maybe we should instead focus on proper recovery and nutrition and not necessarily pull back on the program. Mm -hmm. It's like, when are we ever going to have time to progress? Cause this, this happens every month. Exactly. What's your opinion on this? Because I see this all over sports science, Twitter. Mm -hmm. I hate it. I I hate it too. I think it's furthering doing a disservice to female athletes within research. I think it's been great that we're doing more research on females, but now we're doing this thing that once again Mm -hmm. is, I think it's a disservice to females. Um, why, why are we doing these little nitty gritty things that have such a marginal effect from what we know right now, such a marginal effect on actual performance and recovery, changing how we're training around our menstrual cycle also our hormones are multifactorial and we're all focused on testosterone. And we think we like to vilify estrogen. Estrogen has been shown to be a part of the tissue reparation process. So actually if we train really hard when estrogen peaks, that could be a good thing because estrogen is allowing our tissues to recover faster. That's where, if you do look at the differences between males and females in terms of recovery, a lot of females can do, let's say higher volume or train more frequently compared to males, one, we have a different muscle, muscle masses. So we don't get as quite fatigued, but two, with a higher level of estrogen, it actually helps aid in the recovery process because estrogen is an anti-inflammatory. So quite frankly, we need to start talking about the positives of being a female when it comes to this, because we don't know enough. We do not know enough. And I, from a biochemical background, it really frustrates me because in my studies, you know, my undergrad and master studies, I'm like, hey, in biochemistry, we always talk about how we still don't really know everything about estrogen and testosterone. And then you turn to sports science, they're like, oh, testosterone is peaking. We should totally take advantage of this. Like one rep max? Like, yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. That, because exactly. what if she has two games that week? Like, exactly. You know, how does that, how does that? Multifactorial. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And female athletes in this realm is still such a new thing. I'd love it if we stopped doing such a disservice to us. And instead we recognize that we have our menstrual cycles. We recognize that's a conversation to have with your athlete because yeah, I know exactly what that's like. Sometimes when I have a really have a period, I'm like, oh man, it's so hard for me to like brace. I just feel like I can't. And that happens sometimes, but that's a me thing. That doesn't mean that's a you thing because your period is different than my period. And my period this month could be different than my period next month. And that's normal and that's okay. But it doesn't mean that we need to change things. It means have a conversation about it, be open about it. Don't fear talking about our menstrual cycles. Let's focus on those big things first and get our athletes training frequently with consistently year round, focusing on new sleep and nutrition. And if your athlete does that, and then you want to throw in these little nuances, Mm -hmm. I am much more, I'm, I'm less angered by it, but we're, we're, we're not focused on the big things. We're so as a society, we like to focus on the little things before the big things, because the big things are less sexy, but the big things work. Yeah. They've, they've always worked. And I I love that. It's like, if you can't stay consistent with the big rocks in female athlete performance training, then hold on a second, pump the brakes on Mm -hmm. tracking hormones in the menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and like you said earlier, it's like, that's more for like elite professional athletes who have access to a sports scientist, you Mm -hmm. know, nutritionist, a psychologist, and they can manipulate the training environment a little bit better. Whereas we're just dealing with the everyday youth female athlete, and Mm -hmm. we're trying to get her to be consistent with just even strength training. And we still struggle to do that. So Mm -hmm. do you really think we're going to get them to track the menstrual cycle right Mm -hmm. away, especially a 13 year old girl who you're just getting comfortable with? Mm -hmm. It's way easier for a 28 year old, you know, Alex Morgan or whoever, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm not saying there isn't value in tracking if you're ready to do it 
it, go for it. Mm -hmm. But let's focus on the big rocks. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Take your menstrual cycle as a data point, not the driving factor of what determines what you should be doing in your, in your program. And I think for me, what bothers me the most is like when the U S national women's team came out saying, you know, that they've been tracking their menstrual cycle. I'm like, why are we talking about the fact that these professional athletes have their periods? Our adolescent athletes are not. Can we talk about that instead of worrying about let's, oh yes, if they're tracking, we should track too. Right. Okay. Right. We have athletes playing at a professional level that are getting regular periods. Yet we have adolescent athletes that are playing a ridiculous amount of hours per mm-hmm. week and their periods are very irregular, if not missing. Reds is a big thing. Why don't we focus on that? I feel like if anything that taught us about the men- about the menstrual cycles that Yep, you can be a high performing athlete and still have a regular menstrual cycle. That's mm-hmm. where I feel like we I wish the general public kind of took that away from that from when they revealed that versus, oh, let's all jump on the menstrual cycle tracking train where it's right. like, guys, we're missing the big picture here. This is important. We should focus on this. Getting regular periods year round and not if you don't have your period, not going first thing to an oral contraceptive. That's older practice. Instead, that's that's a bandage on the symptom. Why isn't your athlete getting her menstrual cycle? We should focus on that first. I'm glad you brought up the U S soccer team example, because yes, it, it did bring awareness. And I, I did love what Don Scott talked about was she was like, you know, we're not necessarily changing the, the training because we have mm-hmm. things to accomplish, but we're focusing on nutrition during certain times and based on each player's symptoms, which, which I love. Cause that's like the big rock is, is nutrition, yeah. but it's very dangerous when 13 year old female soccer teams are like, well, we should do exactly what the U S national team does. And that's the message it sends, but context matters. The U S women's team was able to sync their periods because they live together during this time. <laughs> And the athletes you and I work with, Emily, they're all in different clubs. They're from different counties. There's no way we're going to be able to sync people and get everyone on a similar program. No, exactly. (laughs) Not going to happen. (laughs) Exactly. Not going to happen, especially with the adolescent population where really their first two years of you getting your period, it's your body figuring itself out. What you're, what we're tracking here is actually an area that we have very little research on because we don't really know how long it takes for our, for our athletes, menstrual cycles to regulate when they first get it. It takes years for your hormones to find its natural cycle because your body is growing. And those hormones that are cycling for you to get your period also affect your ability to grow your ability to fight off sickness. Like all of those are affecting different things and you're in a state of high growth. There's a reason that once you get your period, normally it's known like a year or so after you're pretty much done in terms of growing because they're related because they're very much related. So we need to understand that her body's just figuring it out and that's okay. And let's worry a little bit less about oh my God, you know, what, what does this look like? And said, Hey, is it coming within 28 to 45 days between? Cause her body's still figuring it out. Is it coming more frequently? Is it kind of infrequently? Let's take note of it. And let's watch this over time because you can't manipulate what we don't know. Let's, let's understand what's going on here and know that her body is still figuring itself out. And that's beautiful. That's what growing up is about. And your body is finally coming to maturation your hormones will be different and that's okay. Oh, man, this has been an amazing conversation. And I think the biggest takeaway today for ACL injuries and female athlete performance is do the basics first, mm-hmm. do them for a year consistently and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Emily, is there anything else you want to add as we wrap up? Oh, I couldn't have said that any best. Give it a year. Give yourself a year of consistency, focus on the big rocks, strength and conditioning training year round, focusing on getting eight to 10 hours a night of sleep consistently, focus on making sure you're eating high quality foods frequently throughout the day. Do that for a year. And if you're still having issues, it's very, I, I, I would bet against that actually happening. I would bet that your body is going to benefit the way that you want to after a year of consistency and habit building, because that's what matters most. It's your baseline. Let's, let's build our baselines before we go from anywhere else. 
Emily, this has been awesome. And I'm so glad you came on to talk about this. And obviously you're really into the science and evidence-based side, but you see this every day. You coach youth female athletes every single day. And guys, I really hope you listen to what Emily had to say today. And I definitely want you to follow up with her. So Emily, where can everyone find you? The best way is really on our Instagram. So it's just relentless underscore athletics underscore. Um, from there, you can find our website. You can find ways of contacting us, but that's like the best way to get in touch. Awesome. So guys, check that out in the caption below. Be sure to follow Emily on Instagram and see all the amazing things she's doing with her female athletes. We'll see you next time. Emily, thank you again. Thank you so much. I love being here.